Hi, I'm Lois Powell. And I'm Susan Schuler, And we're here to share tips, tricks, ideas, and resources to help you discover what's your story. Hi, everybody. Hi, Lois. Thanks for coming back. Hi, Susan. It's great to be back. I'm looking so forward to telling everybody about what to do with their research now that they've gotten started. I agree. So today's topic is going to be focusing on your location. And what about location? How do I start? Well, one of my favorite things when I'm doing research is to really um, look at the fan club and see who, who your fan club is, the fancy way of saying your ancestors, friends, associates, and neighbors. So when you're looking at that marriage record, who witnessed their wedding? When you're looking at that um, baptismal certificate, who witnessed their children being baptized? Those aren't just strangers off the street. Those were people who were important to your family. Um, when you're going through the census, take note to who their neighbors were, who lived in the same apartment building they did, who lived on the same street that they did, whose farm wasn't the closest to their farm. Those people are going to be good clues in identifying other relatives or maybe an extended family members. And they're going to give you a nice uh, round piece of information to start looking at your location. And what's one of the first things we like to do? We like to look at maps. Absolutely. I love maps, especially old maps. But when you pinpoint the town, the village, the county where your relative, your ancestor lived, um, find a map. Go to the go to the website of the local library, um, the Library of Congress, the New York Public Library, the, the Chicago Library, all great places to find maps. Google. Google. Google Maps are beautiful. Um, I found out where my grandparents lived in Paris in 1840. And I was able to look right like, with that Google satellite, that Google Earth. You could go right in and see, you know, there's all convenience stores and stuff there now. But, you know, someday I hope to go there. And now I know exactly where to, you know, what things to landmarks to look for. And maps are important, especially as you get into smaller areas, because now that you've got the fan club, you can start to see where the churches were, mm -hmm. where that um, courthouse was, where all that information was. And those are the areas that you can start to use as resources for getting information. Absolutely. And consider that um, if your ancestor lived in one part of the county and that courthouse was way far, 100 miles away, they might not have uh, registered their documents at that courthouse. They might have used the one in the um, neighboring county that was closer to their home. And a good example of that, by the way, there's many things, but a lot of people think, oh, my goodness, for citizenship records, I just have to go to the state level or I have to go to some level. And back early on, that isn't necessarily how it happened. In the early 1800s, you might have had your relative apply for citizenship right in their local community. And you didn't even know that. But it's possible. So be very aware of those local informations not to just look for specific records, but do a good broad search of records. Right. And many people complain that when you write to the state to get a record, I know I, I do a lot of New York research um, and they're famous for taking forever. You know, I've seen people um, say that it's taken them two years to get the birth certificate they paid for um, or the death record that they paid for. I have to say that I don't know if I'm doing an end run, but I've um, had a lot of luck over the pandemic um, writing to the town, like looking, going on the website, looking for the town clerk, writing them, sending them the, the same New York State form for genealogy, sending my check for $22, and I've had my records back in less than a week. One time I had a guy, um, one of the town clerks in Orange County, New York, email me a, a question for clarification, and then he emailed me the document and has yet to cash my check. So I think that that's a good, I think maybe these local um registrars, towns, villages, um, they can't take in-person appointments right now. So now is a good time to be mailing your, your information out because they might be looking for projects to do. And be aware of county lines. They moved. They absolutely move. If you're looking for your relative, um, a great example of this is um, I was helping a lady here at the library with her genealogy. And for the longest time, it was they lived in this town in Virginia. The next census, they lived in Virginia, and then suddenly they weren't in Virginia anymore. They they all moved to West Virginia, she told me. No, they didn't move. 
the border changed. Suddenly there was West Virginia and now they were residents of West Virginia. And you can find that in counties too. Buffalo, New York, I found out there's a whole other county called Black Rock area and I didn't even know it existed. And I thought my family had moved as well, only they hadn't. Right now, um, I do a lot of research for Rockland County, New York. And Rockland County is known as a uh, for, uh, daughter county because originally when um, Orange County was formed, all of the land of Rockland County was part of Orange County. And then eventually they, they broke it off and made the two counties. But if you're looking for records for Rockland County in the early uh, 17 and 1800s, you're not going to find them because they don't exist because it was part of Orange County. So keep that in mind because sources are going to be um, perhaps in a different county than you're thinking they're mm -hmm. going to be or a different town or even a different state than you're thinking about. We've talked about using the libraries as a good source. We've talked about using local courts as a good source. Another good source are history museums and historical societies. Absolutely. Um, I had a great grandfather. I had a picture of him. I was fortunate enough to know who it was. And I knew he was standing in front of a printing press. And I knew he was at a building because there was a glass window behind him and the words were backwards. It didn't occur to me what I could do with that information. So I wrote to the Buffalo History Museum and I sent them the picture. And they were smart enough, which, by the way, I was not. <laughs> they were smart <laughs> enough to reverse the picture. And they told me it was the Hollings Press. Not only did they tell me it was Hollings Press, but they gave me information about the building, the time period, when the building had moved. And these were all important clues that just required somebody who had some knowledge of the town. So historical museums can be extremely helpful. Similarly, historical societies can be very, very helpful. Um, I'll give you another example. I was on one of the websites, Ancestry.com, and I found a passenger list of a two times great grandfather. And in it, it referenced a, a gentleman who wrote a book, which is where the information is sourced from. So, of course, I had to go find that out. So I went and researched my local library and found that they had that book. Well, that is a great way to start. It's easy. Just go to the local library, get the book. I flipped through it. My family name was in there. So, of course, me. Then I had to go out to Google. I had to purchase the book because of course. I had to have it because we all need our sources. But that one little source on the ancestry record led me to a book that gave me a great deal of detailed information. That book author then led me to the Wheatfield uh, Historical Society in western New York because that's where he was from and he worked with that historical society. That historical society then, when I contacted them, and I, I gave them $20 because it's an annual membership, not very big, well worth it. but came to find out not only to get more stories about my family, but the museum itself is set in my two times great grandmother's home. So oh my God. You just have to follow all the threads, yeah. pay attention to the details, but it's all about that location. So that was not a story in your family. You didn't know that your ancestor's right. house had been turned into a museum. I didn't even know I had an ancestor in Wheatfield, New York, until I found doing my search, doing my bibliographies, and just following those threads. Wow. So Lois, have you been to this museum? Well, I had planned to go this year, but uh, unfortunately, as we all know, with the pandemic, uh, no, we did not go. Hopefully next year, I would very much still like to get there and get to the historical to. society. Yes, You have to. It's like a life goal now. <laughs> At this point, it is. Yeah. Yes. I think, you know, they should open the door and roll out the red carpet and have <laughs> trumpets and, you know. Well, I'll be sure to pass that on. Yes, I think that you should be a benefactor or something. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. I've dreamed of turning ancestral homes into museums, but I've, ne I've never met anyone who already had one. Well, you know, things happen, uh -huh. so it's always possible. See, to me, that is pure genealogy serendipity, you know? Pure genealogy serendipity. Yeah, for so, sure. But you've had some pretty good successes yourself in some areas. I, I have, I have. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, of, well, first off, I think we should talk about libraries, because never underestimate the power of the library or your librarian. Now, maybe you're researching a small town in Ohio. Maybe you're researching people in upstate New York. What I would do is I would look for the library's website and I would go through and see if they have tabs for genealogy for local history. I would look in their catalog and see, um, do they have resources very specific to your hometown? Um, what are they? You know, learn them, learn where you can find things. Um, the librarian, 
um, could be somebody that you could, there might be a button on their website that says, ask the librarian. And you could write to them and sometimes just for a nominal fee or for copies, they'll do an obituary lookup and they'll tell you that, no, there's no obituary for this person or um, here it is. And I photocopied and emailed it to you or, you know, sent it to you. Um, they'll do, they'll do research. Like the book you were looking for, you probably could have called the local library or emailed the local librarian. Um, and, and I did that. That's how I found it at the local library. Exactly. Um, went over and looked at it. It was a very nice little thin paperback, which is why then, of course, I had to purchase it. But so if it hadn't been for the library, I wouldn't have been able to go in and actually look at it and find out how valuable it was. Absolutely. And amazing. And amazing. Yeah. Um, like I said, look at the look on your library's website for a local history tab. Um, my local library from my hometown is digitizing local newspapers. They're part of a consortium of um, Hudson Valley, Historic Hudson Valley, and they are um, they have a web a link on their website for the Hudson Valley Historical Newspaper Database, and it's all towns up and down the river, or probably from past Albany to the bottom of New Jersey, um, where New York meets New Jersey, not New Jersey, um, and it's all different times, it's all different newspapers going from the like the early 1800s up into the 40s or the 50s. And I found so many obituaries that way. I found um, newspapers were different then. You know, they they had big news would be like, so-and-so was visiting grandma from Brooklyn, you know, um, and I was able to, to make some connections and figure out, oh, that must be her maiden name and that's her niece visiting. Um, just little things, things, you know, somebody had a baby shower and they listed every person who came. Yes. You know, yeah, old newspapers can give you a wealth of information because it was all stories that because that's how people communicated. Yeah. They wanted it's kind of like our Facebook today. It's the way they communicated stories of what was going on in their world. Absolutely. I discovered that my grandmother's great uncle was a priest. I had no idea. But I, I found him being. um, oh, What is it called when they when they become a priest? They. They, they, ordained? They, yeah, ordained. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and they had a ceremony at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And um, I never knew. I never knew anything about this man. You know, obviously, because he didn't have any kids. And that's a, that's a terrific source. And you mentioned St. Patrick's Cathedral. Another great mm, source are churches. are churches. If you're in towns, look at the small churches. You can communicate with them again. You can write to them. Email might work. Who knows? Maybe you can even go to them, depending on where you physically are with the holidays coming up. But churches are a terrific source. Now, they have a lot of records, especially births, marriages, deaths. But you may find that the church has turned over. It might be a different church. It might not even exist anymore. You may need to do a little more research to try to find the records. I have an example. Um, my uncle was a Lutheran minister. And so I went looking for that church and that information, and that church doesn't exist anymore, and the records, nobody seemed to know. So I went back to modern technology and started researching online and found that there is a Lutheran Institute that kind of oversees all the Lutheran churches in America. And I contacted them, and they were extremely helpful. Unfortunately, they didn't have what I wanted. Uh, what they told me was that all records before 1915 were not maintained in that church anymore. And so all those records are lost. The funny thing that came out of that was I had given them all my research. And so they asked if they could keep it in their files so that I could help someone else in the future. But don't give up on churches just because you think, oh, that church is gone. I'm, I'm not going to be able to research it. Keep finding angles. There are different ways to get to those records if they exist. There are, and, I, and lots of churches have a website, and on their website, they will give the history of the church, and they may list all of the people who were clergy from the whole time it, it's been in existence. Um, also, they may have a tab on their website that says genealogy, and will tell you how to get documents from them if you're searching for a document. Um, one of the best databases I think out there is Find My Past. Not as popular as Ancestry focuses mostly on British Isles and Ireland. But um, one of the things that they've been able to do is that they have an agreement with the Archdiocese in New York and they're digitizing their records. Um, and not just New York, they have Baltimore, they have uh, Philadelphia. I believe they're working on New Orleans. 
Um, so now you can find baptismal records there for New York Archdiocese, um, ma uh, marriage records. I've solved so many brick walls just with that database. And I pay $19.99 a month. It's worth every cent to me. And that's another good point. Let's We talk about location, 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 but we can use modern technology too. Absolutely. Bounce back and forth, not just one or the yeah. other. And using your thought, Facebook groups. There are a lot of Facebook groups. Um, in my family, I'm German. There are German Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. You can find religious Facebook groups, just genealogy Facebook groups. Go out to those Facebook groups, look around a little bit, see if you think it's something that might be of value, and then you can join them. Yeah. If you can think of an ethnicity, a place, um, anything, uh, there is a, there's a got to be a Facebook group for it. There probably is. Um, there's a professional genealogist named Catherine Wilson, and it's Wilson with two L's in the middle. And she has a website, and she's she's created a website called Facebook for Genealogy, and she has a list. It must be thousands of Facebook groups. Um, I've seen uh, Dutch ones, Finnish ones, New York ones. Um, you name it, it's out there. If it's not, then build it. Make one for your cousin. Make a private Facebook group just for your family genealogy. Um, and that way, you know, share information with relatives. And that's a great way to get people interested. Um, I wanted to go back to churches for a second, if that's OK. Um, my great great grandmother worked in a church in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. And she um, worked in this church. Um, this church was in the woods um, and it was founded by two ladies who actually started an orphanage at this church. And my great grandmother um, worked in their kitchen and did the laundry and was kind of a the house matron. Um, so that was in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Flash forward many, many years. Um, I've been to that church. I've always gone there and felt extra special knowing that my great great grandmother lived there in that area, in that actual abbey of the church. Um, and in the early 2000s, I met a woman who wrote a book. Her husband was the rector at that church, and she wrote a book about this church, which was St. John's in the Wilderness, Episcopal Church. And so she wrote the history of this church. And I read the book, and I thought, God, I wonder I wonder if she found any other records or just knew her name or knew who she was. So um, I sent her an email, and um, she wrote me back, and she was thrilled to hear from me. And um, she went through the records uh, that she had, um, that she wrote this book based on. And she had the journals, the diaries of the woman who started the church, who was like the benefactor of the church. And she found all the pages where my great great grandmother was mentioned and she photocopied them and gave them to me. Um, and she lived in that area. And she used to come to um, my town to go to the dentist. So we would meet <laughs> every time she went to the dentist, we would go to lunch after. Or before and we would just talk about the church and then she brought me there and she brought me into the to the the living quarters and I got to imagine if this was my great great grandma's room and then I went obviously the kitchen is much more modern than it was in 1900 but you know it, it just felt special you know you got to really feel it so I have no museum in my family but I do have St. John's in the Wilderness Church Genealogy isn't just facts. You just bring oh, that out. Absolutely, it is, it is experiences, it is memories, it is bringing all these people to lives, and that all happens as you go down each of these paths. This is why location was so important for us to talk to us about today, because that's a real way to get to the human side of it. The story, the story. Yeah, we're back to what's your story. Right. So we hope that you've enjoyed this episode and we hope that you will let us know if you have comments or questions about what we've talked about or if you have an idea that you think uh, we should talk about in our next episode. Uh, please let us know. You could leave us a comment here or you could call the library or send one of us an email and we would look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks for listening.